morning. So glad that you're here to worship our God and to edify one another this Sunday. Uh, today we're going to talk about identity crisis. Identity crisis. Who are you? You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, I'm Logan, but I, I didn't choose the name Logan. In fact, when I think about it, I didn't even choose to exist. <laughs> that, that wasn't my decision at, at all. And it's, I'm willing to venture that same goes for all of you all. You didn't choose your name. You didn't choose to exist. Yet, here we are. We find ourselves here. And as a human with, with consciousness, the world manifests itself as a moral landscape. And what I mean by that is we are constantly in a state of making decisions. In fact, each moment we're making a decision, right? Because we have the, the decision... Uh, to wake up, right? To brush my teeth or to eat breakfast or to work or not to work, right? All these things we have to make decisions about, all these micro decisions day to day, almost nearly every second of the day, right? To the point of where are we looking, right? What am I saying right now? All these things we have to think about. And embedded within us in the human existence, we have competing wills and voices for who we should be, how we should be, how we should behave. And this comes both from inside ourselves and externally. So you have, if you can relate to this, Paul talks about this struggle in the inner man, right? That there's a thing I desire to do and a thing I don't want to do, and I end up doing the thing I don't want to do and not doing the thing I do want to do, and just this mess that is the human existence where we're in this constant striving, all this competition for how we should be, how we should behave. And sometimes it comes from other people, right? Other people pressuring us or saying, you should be this or do this or do that. And we don't know who to listen to. We don't know who we are. And in the state of making decisions, most of us have made bad decisions, you know, sometimes of catastrophic proportions at times. And sometimes I think that we need to just stop, just take a moment and really ask ourselves, what am I moving towards? What's, what's my goal? What's my next decision? Am I just letting life happen to me and just every day is just in a rut and I'm just kind of going with the flow with no real meaning or purpose? Or are we making decisions that matter? Are we making decisions that bring us closer to who we want to be? To the world, the goal of life is happiness, right? To find happiness. And happiness entails no suffering, right? Now, which, what parents here would want for their kids, you know, if you say, what do you want for your child? Would you say, I want them to be happy. I want them to have no bad thing happen. I don't want them to have any struggles. If that's the case, then they're going to be staying at home, living with you, right? And you wrap them in bubble wrap and feed them milk and cookies all day, every day. And then that's, that's how you know they'll be safe, they'll be happy, they won't struggle for anything. Now, I'm sure you don't want that as a parent, right? You don't want your children to merely just be happy. You want them to find meaning. You want them to find purpose. You want them to find who they are, right? What their role is, what their identity is. And you want them to be able to make those decisions for themselves, for them to be rooted in who they want to be in their identity. And the funny thing about Scripture is, it, not, not that it just focuses on God's people, but the funny thing is that with God's people, these patriarchs were not, were not upstanding citizens, like, we wouldn't call them saints, per se. A lot of them did a lot of good things, but a lot of them, you look at their lives, it's filled with brokenness and a lot of things that we would be scandalized if one of us, if one of us here did them, right? We'd be like, ooh, I don't know about that brother. He's done some really messed up stuff in his life. I think the best illustration of the plight of an individual searching for their identity is none other than Jacob. So we're going to try to run through Jacob's life. I talk about Jacob a lot, but Scripture is kind of like a bottomless pit of meaning, right? Like you keep scratching, you fall, oh, here's the bottom, and then you fall into another layer, and you're like, oh, well, I thought this was the bottom. Then you go another layer, and that's been me the past two weeks studying this. I've had, I've had to be like, I've had to rewrite this a, a handful of times. So this is not the end-all, be-all of the Jacob narrative. There's a, so much more than we can cover this morning. Um, so just a reminder, Jake was born into a family that was in covenant with God, right? Because God made a covenant with Abraham that, he, he, that, that the nation, the land, many children, that through his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
And Paul said that the gospel was first preached to Abraham. So this is very important, right? This is the hope of humanity was carried out through this earthly family of Abraham. But surprisingly, and this is kind of quite shocking to us as modern readers, being in a relationship with God does not really answer all the questions of one's identity. I mean, you can see that with Abraham, right? And, and with Jacob as well. Even though they knew God, they heard the voice of God, yet a lot of times they struggled with where I'm supposed to be, what decisions am I supposed to make, who am I really? And in Genesis 25, 22, we get the account of the birth of Esau and Jacob. It says in verse 22, the children struggled together within her. All right, so in the womb, Jacob is struggling. Do you see this? He's wrestling. Like he's a cantankerous uh, child before he's even born. And she said... If it is thus, why is this happening to me? And we know she was in severe labor pains. In the Hebrew, it's not quite that fancy. If it is thus, why is this happening to me? In the Hebrew, it's, oh God, why? And it's just broken up sentencing because she's in the thralls of this pain and, she, and she's crying out to God and says, so she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. All right, now I know that's, that, I wish I could illustrate how shocking this would be for the time. All right, this would almost be on the level of scandal because in the ancient Mesopotamian region, not just with the Hebrews, all across the land at that time, there was the right of the firstborn. The firstborn child, he gets the birthright. He gets the inheritance of the father. And, you know, it was way better than just dividing, you know, all your stuff among all your kids because then, like, each one has, like, two goats. And, like, all right, now no one's going to be successful. So they kind of put all their eggs in one basket. All right, the oldest child, that's the way to make sure that the household, that the family continues, right? And yet God makes this strange statement that the older shall serve the younger. That's not how things work. That's not how the line of authority extends in the human culture. So from birth, Jacob is found striving, and we know that when he's born, what is he doing? He's grabbing on to his older brother's heel. Now, if you're in a race, what happens if someone grabs your heel? Right? What are they trying to do? We, you know, if you think about it that way, you're trying to pull them back. Why are you trying to pull them back? That way you can get ahead. Right? So we see this is, this is God's foreknowledge. He knows how Jacob is, and he knows what he's going to do, and he knows what Esau is going to do. So these two children were named Jacob and Esau. And also for this culture, the name of an individual identifies much more than the name. Like, my name is Logan, and I think technically my dad said it means cove or something that he, like, looked up on Google with it. Like, he didn't know this when he named me that. That's just what they named me that. And, oh, it means cove or safe haven. But at this time, names were a lot more precious, precious a thing. It was more like a, it, it captured the essence of the, or the spirit of that individual. So it's just saying, this is how this person is. This is how this person will be. Names were very significant. It was much more than a name. It was who they were, their identity, in other words. So Esau, well, it means Harry, all right? That lovely name, right? <laughs> Call me Harry. So he's Harry, he's coarse, he's this rough guy. And Jacob, Jacob or Yaakov, he's a heel grabber or a supplanter. And with that entails this identity of trickery and deception of, of cunning. And, you know, not the guy that you want to play a chess game with because he's going to find some way to cheat you or move when you're not looking or knock the board over, something like that. And so it's kind of funny because Jacob didn't name himself, did he? He received this name. This identity was thrust upon him. So we learn in Genesis 25 that the names are very fitting. Esau is a man's man, right? He's a hunter. He's this brute. He's a man of the fields. Uh, and he's also the father's favorite. Well, that's going to cause some issues in the family, right? If the father has a favorite child. And Jacob, he's smooth. He's a homebody. He's quiet. He's cunning. And he's a mama's boy. Right, So already we have this big uh, contradiction going on here. This, there's a struggle. Things are at odds. Esau was everything Jacob wasn't, which is the problem of the rival brother, right? Because Jacob wanted the position of Esau. He wanted Esau's identity, but he was nothing like him, and there was nothing he could do about it. And this scene sets up the same narrative that we've seen with Cain and Abel, right? The rival siblings. And it's also, I mean, this, it's not just... These things are meta-truths, like we even see it in our, in our media, right? Like Thor and Loki, if you're an Avengers fan, right? These two brothers that are like completely opposite, that have these power struggles, that parents favor different ones. 
It's the same thing. This is an ancient thing. So in the same chapter, we have the famous story of Jacob taking advantage of his brother. Remember, Esau goes hunting. He can't find anything. Jacob's making this delicious stew with this new, this new uh, root in there, this new flavoring. And then Esau's like, hey, give me some of that. Remember what he said in Hebrew? Me gulp that red bread stuff. <laughs> right? So it literally means that he's like, oh, uh, me hungry. right? And remember, he, Jacob, Jacob knows his brother's kind of dumb, right? He knows that he wants what Esau is getting, so he acts with intelligence, right? He's shrewd with trickery in a way. He, ta- he capitalizes on his brother's ignorance or foolishness. So he, Jacob was constantly longing for something more. He was not content to be the youngest or to be excluded from the firstborn blessing. And so he says, hey, I'll give you this pot of stew if you give me your birthright. Remember what Esau does? Does he savor it? Does he smell it? Does he... Take little sips and mm, that's so good. No, he, he, he drank, he ate it, and he rose up and he left. Didn't even care, right? And it says, thus he despised his birthright. So in Genesis 27, so he's already kind of taken advantage of his brother here. And from Hebrews, we learn that Esau really regretted this decision. In Genesis 27, we find a brutal family drama. Isaac, the father, he's old, he's blind, he's knocking on death's door. He doesn't know when he's going to go, but he feels his time is soon. And so he wants to set his affairs in order before he dies. Remember, Isaac's carrying the blessing of Abraham, right? And that's a big deal because he's carrying the promise that will be the salvation of the world through Jesus Christ. That's, this is a huge deal. And so he wants to make sure he gets everything in order and he gives this blessing to his firstborn son because that's just what you do. The firstborn gets the birthright. He carries the promises. He calls Esau the assumed next family patriarch, and tells him to hunt for food and make a delicious meal, right? He's like, uh, before, I, before I go, I want a delicious meal. Go out and get my favorite food, hunt. And afterward, he would bless him with a prophetic word as was done for the oldest son. Because it's more than just saying, you know, because we say like, oh, bless you, and someone sneezes, right? This blessing, there was something divine about it, right? It's almost like a prophetic word that God empowered this, and what was said was accomplished for the individual. So Rebecca heard about this, and who's Rebecca's favorite child, remember? Yaakov, the mama's boy, right? The tent dweller, the, the quiet, meek one. It says, and she wanted her favorite child to get this blessing instead of Esau. Rebecca pressures her son to do something that he's not comfortable doing. Identity theft. Anyone been in identity theft before? Okay, all right, I won't ask. Genesis 27, 8. Notice, this is his mother speaking to him. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. All right, that's important. Notice the commanding tone of his mother. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob has a problem with this. In verse 12, he says, perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. He says, hey, mom, what if this comes back to bite me? (laughs) Right? (laughs) I don't know if this is such a good idea. Notice. His mother said to him, let the curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Bring them to me. Just like a mother does, right? They can't, right? Yeah, I want you to do this. This is a good thing to do. Do it. And hopefully your mother isn't trying to get you to deceive your father or lie to your father. But right, we, we see this. this. There's almost this over-attachment that's going on here. In verse 15, it says, Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. All right, in... in this culture, clothes were a huge signifier of identity. We notice oftentimes in cases of deception in Scripture, what do they do? They change their clothes. They change their appearance. They're changing their identity in order to deceive. And so Jacob is changing his identity into his brother, into that of the firstborn. And the skins of the young goat she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. So the quiet, cunning mama's boy is heeding the voice of his mother to pretend to be someone that he isn't, right? He's not comfortable with that first, but he goes ahead and he complies. Did Jacob name himself, or was this identity thrust upon him by his family? Or was this a case of self-fulfilling prophecy? Perhaps his whole life he's been called supplanter, right? This tricky deceiver. And it seems like his mom has kind of pushed them into this role or encouraged him to to continue this. Or maybe God knew. These are questions, right? I I don't have all the answers. But regardless, there's going to be voices that try to tell us who we are or what we should do or who we should be. 
So they proceed with the plan to cheat Esau out of his blessing and to deceive Isaac. It is here that a very important question is asked. In verse 18, it says, So he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, here I, here I am. Who are you, my son? Who are you? You know what Jacob answered? I'm Esau. It's a confused young man, right? He's struggling with his identity. The deception is successful, but it's not without conflict. Remember what was he worried about happening? That he would get a curse instead of a blessing? Well, he got the blessing, but the blessing ended up being a curse for him, as we're going to see. In verse 36, Esau said, once Esau found out, because he was none too happy when he figured out about all this, says Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob, supplanter? He, He wants something that he can't have, and so he drags me down to get ahead. For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you. The older shall serve the younger. So things have gotten messed up. In verse 41, Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Got a dark language. His mom told Jacob, Rebecca told Jacob, your brother comforts himself <laughs> with the thought of killing you, <laughs> right? That's some pretty sincere hatred when in order to make yourself feel better, you think about killing someone, right? That's the state of his brother. So Jacob is folded under the weight of the voice of his mother and has created no small amount of trouble for him. So what's the solution? Well, once again, mother knows best <laughs> or not <laughs> in this case, right? It's, she says, all right, uh, run. Run away. Verse 43, now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Did you catch that? Obey my voice. Obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran. So Jacob left Beersheba, uh, 2810, and went toward Haran. So if you recall, Haran is where Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, remember that he stopped in Haran after God called him to move to the promised land? In fact, Acts 7 tells us that Abraham tarried there until God removed him from the land. So Haran is this place that's, that's a dodging of responsibility. We can call it the, the divine call, right? That when God calls us towards something, Haran seems to be this place of distraction, right? Where you're not really where you're supposed to be yet. You're on the way, but you're tarrying. It is here in his escape that from the promised land. Think about that. He's leaving the promised land, right, to go where his, his grandfather had left to come to. So you see, this is messing up the order of things. It's backtracking instead of being progressive with the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In verse 15, in this land, right, he's in this land that he's really maybe should not be at. In verse 15, it says, Behold, God says, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. This is after the famous story of Jacob's ladder, right? Where he dreams of this this portal between heaven and earth, this gateway between heaven and earth. And he says, surely the Lord was in this place and I did not know it. But God says, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. So despite Jacob leaving where technically he really should be, he's bearing the promise, right? He's bearing the promise of the promised land, and he's leaving the promised land. So this is actually kind of an avoidance of responsibility. And instead of addressing things, making things right with Esau, he's avoiding the conflict altogether. But God assures him that he is with him. So Jacob goes on to meet and labor for Laban in exchange for Rachel. Remember that? He falls in love with Rachel. He works seven years for Laban. And in an ironic twist of events, the hustler gets hustled. Right? He works for seven years and is tricked into consummating a marriage with the wrong daughter. Oopsie daisy, right? He didn't realize the first, and so he gets the firstborn daughter, Leah. Firstborn, you see, it's so ironic. There's, there's it's a side by side going on here. It's, it's almost as if God's letting him know, hey, remember that? See, it doesn't feel so good when it happens to you, does it? So he works another seven years for Rachel, and he has 12 sons that will turn into the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is, and this is interesting. Out of all the patriarchs that God could have chosen to make their sons like the tribes of Israel, to constitute the identity of God's people, Yahweh chose Jacob. And right now he's kind of a mess. 
He doesn't know what he's doing, right? He's struggling by, he's constantly facing uh, consequences and, and trickery from Laban and trying to move ahead of that. And it's just, it seems like a very contentious time, even among his wives. It seems to be going, a lot of conflict, inner conflict going on. So Laban attempts to trick Jacob out of his wages of livestock, but God protects him from Laban. So why would God protect one deceiver and, and not the other? See, there's some questions to be asked here. They're both deceptive people. They both wronged people. And so what makes God protect one than the other? So Jacob is at this stage of finding his way and in some sense is getting a taste of his own medicine. Yet God still loves him and protects him. Right? We know that from Romans. Eventually, after 20 years, Jacob has had enough of hiding and he's ready to confront the mess that he's running from, that he ran from to begin with. So, ironically, Jacob leaves Laban in, you guessed it, deception. Look at what Laban says. What have you done that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? So I'm starting to get the sense that Jacob does not like conflict. He seems to avoid conflict at all costs rather than address them head on. He either runs or he tricks or he lies in order to maneuver, in order to get ahead. He's relying on his own cunning and his own machinations and the voice of his mother in order to get ahead in life because he's not happy with who he is and he doesn't exactly know what he wants to be or who he is, but he knows that he doesn't want to be what he currently is. <laughs> he wants to be either Esau, he wants to be the firstborn, something he's not. So God, again, providentially protects Jacob from the wrath of Laban. Jacob and his camp journey back to the land promised by Yahweh. So God told him, go home, and he listens. He heads on home. But remember, there's still an angry brother at home, right? Esau, who has had a long time in his mind to stew on how bad that, that Jacob treated him, how much he messed him up. So Jacob devises a plan to ensure his safety. We read that Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, so he divided his camps, all his servants, all his family, all his livestock into two groups. So that way, you know, if he kills, because he heard Esau was coming with 400 men. Uh-oh, <laughs> uh, that's a lot of people, right? And so he's like, oh, he's preparing for war. So his idea is, all right, so if, if Esau and his men take one group, this other group will get away, right? And so, he, so what's he doing right now? What's he, how's he trying to get ahead of the situation? Cunning, right? Thinking about how can I manipulate the situation or make decisions in the situation that will benefit me. That will keep me safe. So notice he makes the plan, and then he says, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. So it, Jacob, throughout the narrative, he's told God, Well, if you do this for me, I'll give you a tenth. And right here, he's just reminding, Hey, God, remember what you said. It's almost this transactional attitude, right? That he wants something more, and he's willing to bargain for it, whether it's with God or with humans. So Jacob uses his cunning first, and then he consults a God. In verse 23 of chapter 32, it says, He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. So he's right near the same place that he started off when he ran away. Alone, near the promised land, right? Once he was leaving, now he's coming back, and he finds himself in the same state. So he's at the door of the promised land, and he's alone, and he's terrified. So what we read next is a jarring and perplexing account. It says, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. What? Oh, okay, what? Some dude just randomly attacked him? It says, When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, Which what a twist of events. His hips put out of place, and then you read, let me go for the day has broken. So you think Jacob's begging for mercy, right? Let me go so I can get away, but no, Jacob speaks. I will not let you go unless you bless me. So even though he's had his hip put out of socket, he's still hanging on and struggling and saying, I'm not letting you go until you bless me, until I get ahead, right? Until I find a way to advance. So a man wrestled with Jacob. They were equally matched, but all it was took was a touch from this mysterious man to put his hip out of joint. There's a lot more going on here than meets the eye, right? There's something odd about this. Why the hip near the thigh? Why that specific place? Why not his shoulder? Why not crack his skull? Why not break his knee? 
Why the hip near the inner thigh? So in the ancient thought, the, the inner thigh was associated with trustworthiness or honesty. Remember the, the promise that's made? Uh, it, well, he said, oh, I'm drawing a blank. When Abraham makes his servant swear to him, he puts his hand on his thigh and says, swear to me that you'll do this. Because that's the place of trustworthiness, of honesty, right? And so I don't think it's accident that the place that was considered the place of honesty and trustworthiness is exactly where this man injured Jacob. Because what did Jacob struggle with? Honesty and trustworthiness. And that's exactly where he struck. That's exactly where he's hit. In verse 27, it says, And he said to him, guess what? What is your name? This person, angel, spiritual thing, we don't know yet, just based on the text. Uh, he says, what's your name? Has Jacob been, at, been asked that before? Who are you? Right? That's why. He says, I'm Esau. Right here, he says, what is your name? And he answers Jacob. The strange supernatural man asked Jacob the same question he has wrestled with his whole life. What is your identity? Who are you? Verse 28, then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed, or and have been delivered. Very odd. <laughs> very, very odd. So why here? Why now? Why did God attack him? Why did Jacob prevail? Why a change of name? So I believe that we can find the key to this mystery once Jacob meets Esau. So guess what Jacob does? After this event, he abandons the scheme that he had. In fact, it says that he goes on ahead of all the parties, all the groups, and he addresses, he confronts the conflict that he's been avoiding for all these years. For over 20 years, he's been avoiding this. He ran from this, and now he's going face to face. In verse 10 of chapter 33, Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand. He says this to Esau when Esau greets him. And it's all good. He's not there to kill him. He says, for I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. Thus he urged him, and he took it. So how is seeing the face of Esau like seeing the face of God? The two aren't an accident. You see, the striving with God, the wrestling, getting hit in the place that he's always struggled with his whole life, it was a wake-up call for him. It was a wake-up call to his deception, right? To God's loyalty to him, even when he hasn't been loyal to Yahweh completely. He's wrestled with both, right? He's tried to get ahead in both relationships, with his brother and with God. He was constantly trying to find a way to gain advantage of God and man, and it worked. And it worked. Now, did it work because Jacob was so smart and cunning? Or did it work because he had a God who loved him despite his shortcomings? It's God's grace. And that's what Jacob finally understood. He says, for God, Yahweh has dealt graciously with me, and I have enough. For the first time, he isn't trying to get ahead. Did you catch that? I have enough. He realizes that he's struggled with God. He's been flip-flopping in his relationship with God, and yet God's still taking care of him. And that's a humbling thought. And not that Jacob won that wrestling match. It's that he was delivered, right? Because if all it took was a touch to break his hip, what could, have been, what could have happened? One touch of poof, right? Snapped out of existence. Yet that didn't happen. And it was out of Yahweh's love, not out of Jacob's cunning. So our takeaway, there are competing voices for what our identity should be. You know, and especially as you grow up, you wrestle with, you know, your parents always have a vision for you, no matter what it is, right? Like, I, I want you to do this, or I want you to be like this, or I, I have these aspirations for you, and these are the things you should be. And when you're growing, when, when you get your own roots, it's hard to discover, all right, well, how much of it do I keep? What do I establish for my own? What's my identity? What's my faith? And what are my parents' faith? And those things are things that have to seriously be sorted out, because if you just go on cruise control and you just assume that everything's good and you just go along with everything that, that's said, it's not your faith. In, likelihood, in all likelihood, no human being is perfect, right? And so there's bound to be, no matter how good your parents were, there's bound to be some things that weren't so accurate or weren't so right that you have to find for yourself. But you cannot find your true identity 
if you run from your responsibilities. If there's mistakes you've made, if there's people you've wronged, if there's temptations that you've just gone ahead with living and have no intention of addressing, those things need to be addressed. Those things have to be rectified. You have to be reconciled. But to attack this responsibility, you have to choose to wrestle with God. You have to choose to enter into the conflict, into the struggle with God, and guess what he's going to do? He's going to break your hip sometimes. He's going to hit you exactly where you don't want to be hit. He's going to remove exactly what you don't want removed from your life. But once you enter into that struggle, once you struggle with God, God is a loving God who will make you better for it. He's going to remove the things that make you a bad son and guide you into the way to be a good child. In Matthew 10, 34, it says, Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. And he says in verse 38, And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life, could we maybe swap identity or at least include identity in that? Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Because you may have visions of what you want to be or what you want to do with your life. You may think, I know what my identity is. And Jesus says, I've come to bring a sword into your existence. I've come to chop away those things that make us deceivers, that make us tricksters, that make us hurt people, right? Who make us act deceptively or or transactionally with God and with human beings instead of dealing graciously with other people because God has dealt graciously with us. See, Jacob had learned to stop relying on himself, start, stop relying on other people's visions of him or his own vision of himself, and he learned to let Yahweh transform him, to guide him, to put out of joint what he didn't need and be called to where he should be going. Hebrews 12, 6, For the Lord disciplines the one who? Who is he disciplined? The one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. Now, that's just, people think that's a scary verse. That's awesome, right? Because we got punished by our, our physical parents, right? Our earthly parents. And were they always right? My dad would always say, well, it, that's for the one that you got away with. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, I didn't do anything. Like, well, that's for the one you got away with, right? It's like, ah, oh, God's not going to do that, Right? <laughs> God knows you. He knows what you can bear. He knows what you cannot bear. And he knows what discipline you need to make your life smoother, right? In order to bring peace to your life. And I know we just read, pe- not peace, but a sword. But we have to think about what Jesus is contending for. Because the fruit of the Spirit is peace, one of them. For what son is there whom his father... Uh, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Therefore, he says... Lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak bones and make straight paths for your feet. Was Jacob's path always straight? That was kind of all over the place, right? So that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive, wrestle with what? With peace, with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See, the Hebrew author knows that if you choose to strive with God, people strive with all sorts of things. Everyone struggles with something. Whether it's family, whether it's your work, you're wrestling, you're fighting for a goal. And every goal that you wrestle with that's not God is not fulfilling, it's not eternal, and it will oftentimes just make you feel worse than when you started out. Read Ecclesiastes, right? Strive for all these things, and it didn't satisfy. That, That search in his soul for something more to to find who you are, what's your goal in this life, how am I living, why am I here, meaning, purpose, competency. Those things can only be found when you choose that I'm not going to wrestle with these earthly things. I'm choosing to wrestle with God. And we see it's no accident that God named his people after Jacob. Well, Israel struggles with God. Struggle with God and have been delivered. Because none of us are perfect. We all fight God at some point whether it's temptation, whether it's stubbornness, whether it's sin that keeps creeping up in our lives and we wrestle with it, we're wrestling with God, right? Because we keep competing my way instead of God's way and going back and forth. Yet you can wrestle with God and be delivered. How can that happen? Because we have a God that is that loving, 
that wants a child that he knows he's going to have to discipline. And the Hebrew author says, don't keep fighting him so much so that he has to break a hip, right? Take your lump, (laughs) take your lesson, because God's treating you as his child. So who are you? You will never know until you die to the voices that compete for your identity. You must take the decision to strive with God. He'll hit you right where you don't want to be hit. He'll remove that thing that you really don't want removed. Why? Because he loves you. And he wants you to find your identity as his son. Who are you? Galatians 3.27 tells us that whoever has been baptized into Christ has put on Christ. And who is Christ? He's the son of God. And so if we put on the image of Christ in baptism, through the washing away of our sins, we become children of God. And Jesus, a Hebrew author says that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. That's a crazy thought. So who are you going to wrestle with? Who are you? If you'd like to be a child of God, if you'd like to find your identity in Christ, we ask that you come forward, be baptized as we stand and sing.